Okay, let's get started with the introduction to chapter 21. Um, in this, we're going to talk about economic growth as well as business cycles, unemployment, a whole bunch of macroeconomic stuff. Um, now, notice we made a pretty big jump from chapter 3 to chapter 24. That's because your book is set up for both principles of macro and principles of micro. All right, let's talk about economic growth, business cycles, unemployment, inflation, all kinds of cool stuff. Oh, cool. We got all kinds of cool graphs here. We're going to, this is a fun chapter. Chapter goals. One, we want to explain the difference between a long run framework and a short run framework. And no, it's not just time, it's actually what's, what's variable. Um, summarize some relevant statistics about growth, business cycles, unemployment. Um, list four phases of the business cycle. We'll talk about business cycles a bit. That's the short run. Um, explain how unemployment is measured. We're going to also talk about some of the um, downfalls of unemployment. Um, and we want to talk about this target rate of unemployment and potential income. We'll, we'll actually probably talk a little bit about a relation called Oaken's empirical regularity. And that's what relates unemployment to potential income, although we won't get into the math of it. Define inflation and distinguish a real concept from a nominal concept. All right, and state two important cost of inflation. Um, long run growth frame focuses on incentives for supply. Okay, so we have two frameworks. We've got the long run, we have the short run. Generally in the long run, we assume that the market is fairly flexible. And so if we have something being supplied that isn't demanded, so there's excess supply of something, that will actually cease. It's, people will stop producing it. Why? Because it's a long run. We have a long enough time span to figure out well, what everybody wants and only produce that stuff. So in the long run, we focus on supply. Um, sometimes this is called supply side economics. Well, actually, I don't entirely agree with that. Supply side economics oftentimes is referring to applying this long run framework to short run models. Um, so focusing on su the supply side in the short run um, in reference to business cycles. So, um, but issues of growth are considered a long run framework and that's why we look at supply in, in terms of growth in the long run because demand is inherently a, a short run phenomenon. Short run business cycles focus on demand. Why? Because demand is fairly short run. So in the long run, supply is really all that matters because it's completely flexible. In the short run, though, demand is all that matters because supply is pretty inflexible. If you think about it, I'm producing a factory and I'm producing 100 cars a month. I can't just change that tomorrow. It takes a little bit of time for me to, to change that. So say I want to go to producing 200 cars a month. Well, I'm going to have to work on that a little bit. That takes some time. So that's long run when we talk about changes in, in supply. Um, in the short run, though, we really are focusing on demand and how demand ebbs and flows and how that causes a business cycle. So sometimes called demand side economics. Uh, let's skip the supply side economics and demand side economics. That's actually more stuff you hear um, in... Uh, uh, politics than you do really in economics. Um, let's really focus on long run, short run. Uh, business cycles are generally considered in a short run framework. Yeah, so business cycles, that's the ebb and flow of the business cycle. So sometimes, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Inflation and unemployment definitely fall within both frameworks. All right, we have short term fl inflation, which is associated with the business cycle. We have long-run persistent inflation, which is not necessarily associated with growth, but it's definitely not a short-run phenomenon. Unemployment, we have both short-run fluctuations around what we'll call full employment, which isn't exactly zero unemployment, but as close to it as we can get in the long run. And then we have this long-run component to unemployment, that there's this amount of unemployment that we have, it's kind of permanently. Um, we'll call that frictional unemployment, and actually it's not a bad thing, so we'll talk about that in a minute. All right, so let's talk a bit about growth. Now, if you really want to get into the nitty-gritty of growth and growth theory, I suggest you take intermediate macroeconomics. 
um, where we'll go through the solo growth model and, and, and talk about um, you know the basics of growth theory you know right up to circa 1950 ish um, but here we're going to talk about things in a little more general terms so economists first of all how do we measure growth we generally measure this in terms of change in real gross domestic product well let's 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 take a step back and, and we need to define gross domestic product so gross domestic product is the market value of all final goods and services produced in an economy during a given period of time usually the way we report GDP is quarterly that's the usual statistic that you get although we do have annual GDP at the state level so if we wanted to measure it for Wisconsin we would call it GSP or gross state product um, and that is only available annually uh, but we have some problems using gross domestic product the first one is well prices change over time and let's say we have an economy with two goods um, apples and oranges apples are a dollar oranges are a dollar we produce ten apples ten oranges so the final market value is ten dollars worth of apples ten dollars worth of oranges so the final market value of all final goods and services produced within the economy during that period is twenty dollars but let's say the price doubled on both apples and oranges well if the price doubles then well real G or GDP nominal GDP doubles which would mean our my final market value would be forty dollars but did we really produce more and the answer is well no not really right so we need to adjust for this change in price level because we want to know what the difference in price is so we use real GDP and real GDP adjusts for change in price level but we've got another problem too we also have to deal with um, population changes for example who should have a bigger economy the United States or Iceland well the United States probably should have a much bigger economy because we got a whole lot more people right so we need to produce more in order to feed all the people we have and we think about it again who should have a bigger economy the United States or China well frankly China should because they've got a whole lot more people to feed so we also need to control for population and population growth and all this good stuff so we usually divide real GDP by the population by the current population to get real GDP per capita or as the British like to say per head which kinda sounds like cattle so we don't say that in the United States but you know so the US secular growth rate now secular here refers to um, 100 so long-run growth rate so over like the last hundred years and per capita real output growth have been less than two and a half to three and a half percent per year all right we average right around three percent per year if you wanna look over the long run right per capita real output is real GDP divided by total population like we talked about even if total output is increasing the population may be growing faster so per capita real output may fall so let's say we add more people than we add production what happens overall there's less stuff per person so here's a here's a look at real GDP per capita in the United States you can see it has essentially grown over time pretty steadily these bars these gray bars are called recession bars all right so these are different periods of recession so we can look at the latest recession and we see what happened to real GDP we peaked right here at about 2007 in the beginning of 2008 and then we had the financial collapse and zunk we really crashed one of the biggest crashes in real GDP per capita we've had um, in percentage terms for quite some time we really have to go back a long ways um, that's why sometimes this period right here from about 19 well actually we can go back a little farther all the way back to say the middle 80s alright say 88 something like that on forward up to about here is sometimes called the great moderation because you can see in 1991 we had a recession 
And it was reasonable, but it was pretty darn short. And we didn't lose much income. Then you go to do 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 and along, and all of a sudden here in 2001 we have the, another recession. But look at what happens to per capita GDP. It just flattens, and it actually goes up a little bit during the actual recession. So we don't have any real loss of per capita income. All right, from this period, from say 1991 all the way up to 2008, we really don't have a single recession where we lose per capita income. That's why this is sometimes referred to as the great moderation. You know, it's it's as if we th thought we had the business cycle slain. All right, that we could control the business cycle, and then all of a sudden, well, boom, 2008 hits, and well, we lose an awful lot. Right, and the business cycle comes back with a vengeance. Um, so maybe we haven't completely slain the um, uh, business cycles yet. Maybe we haven't completely tamed them. So um, you can look that up if you want to, talking about the great moderation. All right, global expenses with growth. Well, let's look at our experiences with growth. We can look at growth rates over a long period of time. So first of all, if we look at pre-1950 data, we can see that growth rates were pretty small. Post-1950s data, growth rates seem to almost double for everybody. There's a few where it does more than double, all right? And there's some reasons for that. You have some significant structural changes in the way the Japanese economy works. You have some significant structural changes in the way um, Eastern European economy works in during this time period. Um, let's see, you've got and then some places where you don't see much change. All right. You can also see levels of income. This is in 1990 international dollars. So essentially what we're doing is, well, we're converting all of this to 1990 US dollars using the exchange rate, using exchange rates and inflation um, calculations. So we take care of the different currencies that are being used and we take care of different price levels. And we use 1990 as our base year. So it's as if it were 1990 prices. And we can see what's happened over time. We've definitely had major increases uh, overall in income per person. So what are some of the benefits and costs of growth? Well, Per capita economic growth allows everyone in society on average to have more. All right, so if we have growth, well, then we've got more stuff, so there's more stuff to be had. But we need to really focus on this on average. We haven't really dealt with distributional effects yet. The reason why is because, well, this is macro and it's principles of macro. And generally, we end up aggregating those effects away. So it's on average. Growth or prediction of growth allows governments to avoid hard questions. Oh, yes, this is a great one. So for example, oh, for example, if um, let's say I have a budget deficit. And if we look at the next budgetary period for all 50 states, some of them have different budgetary periods. Like, for example, Wisconsin has a two-year budgetary period. but um, if we look at it for all 50 states, we see that um, the great majority of them, in fact, 43 of them, are projecting a budget deficit. Well, if you have a budget deficit, that means you want to spend more than you're planning on taking in in taxes. So you need to do one of two things, or one of three things. Reduce your spending, increase your taxes, or increase your borrowing. Well, increasing your taxes isn't such a great thing if you're a um, politician because, well, people don't like to have their taxes increased. Decreasing your spending isn't a good thing if you're a politician because people don't like their services cut. And borrowing, well, borrowing isn't sustainable. I mean, you can't do it forever. You can do it for a short period of time, but it's really hard to keep borrowing and borrowing and borrowing and borrowing. Eventually, you end up going bankrupt. So what's the solution? Well, there's kind of the fourth option, grow your way out of it. If you grow, you can increase your tax revenue without increasing your marginal tax rate because we charge a percentage of income. So let's say your income tax rate is 10% of your income goes to um, the government. 
all right, goes to taxes. And you make $100,000 a year, so that means you pay, you pay $10,000 in taxes. But if we grow so that you now make $200,000 a year, well, you still have the same tax rate, so, the, so nobody had to raise taxes. But you're paying $20,000 a year in taxes. Your tax revenue doubles, right? This is great. We get more tax revenue without more taxes, without... Um, or we get more tax revenue without increasing taxes without we don't have to do any more borrowing we don't have to cut spending it's good for politicians growth though comes with costs for example we have pollution all right if we're producing more stuff that means we also produce more waste um, resource exhaustion all right the law of conservation of matter says the amount of stuff we got is the amount of stuff we got all right so we can't just create more out of nothing. Um, so things like oil, things like coal, things like wood, um, building materials, all these natural resources that we have, well they're, they're in limited supply just like every other resource that we have. So we will deplete those faster with growth. And destruction of natural habitat. Um, as we grow, as we grow in population, as we grow in output, it's quite possible that we can destroy a lot of envi we can have a lot of environmental impact. All right. Section 2 coming next.